In this episode, we're going to step away from coding just long enough to experiment with 10 developer-friendly web apps that you should definitely bookmark. Let's get started. The first one is new. It's Chop App, and this is an excellent way to share and collaborate on work. This is especially helpful at your stage where you may need assistance. So let's say there's an error here. You can copy that in, select the language. In your case, it would be one of these two. Chop it. And then you can create notes. So you can say, what does the P tag do? Save it, and then you then have a link right here, which you can share with whoever is going to help you. If you emailed me, you could paste that in, and I would then be brought to this page where I could respond like so. It's very helpful. Definitely bookmark this. Next, we come to Lorem Pixum, and this is part of a new trend. Up until now, when people would create designs, they would often use placeholders for the images, and that would be simply a gray box that said placeholder. But now you can use these simple services that allow you to query the internet for an image that is of the size and dimensions that you require. So for example, let's say I have an image here. And I'm just working on the design right now. I haven't sliced anything out. I don't have anything to work with. In that case, I can simply link to lorempixum.com, and the next two parameters are going to be the width and the height. In this case, I need something that's 400 pixels by 200. Now, if we preview that, you'll see that it randomly brings in an image, and each time the page loads, that'll be different as you can see like so. Now keep in mind, this is for development only, of course. You're not gonna keep these in your projects. It's until you have time to create applicable images for your design. Now, if I need to specify a specific category, I can do that as well. You can see here we have abstract food. Let's choose something from food. So I'll, I will add that as the third segment, food. And now, every time the page loads, we have an image of food. We can update this if it needs to fit a 800 by 200 banner at the top. We're all set, very helpful. Next, we come to Lorem Ipsum, and this is what you'll use to, to generate dummy text. You can see here we can specify the number of paragraphs. I need three paragraphs. Reload the page, and now I have three dummy paragraphs that I can paste into my web design as text filler. Alternatively, using a program like Snippets, you can copy and paste a handful of paragraphs. That way you always have access to it. Speaking of code snippet management, if you don't have a desktop app, there are a handful of web services available. One of them is Snippler. You can create a free account and then track all of your snippets. And programs like the Snippets app that I use connect with this beautifully. So let's take a look at this one. And you can see this is a function that allows you to test for whether or not something is an email address. You can go to plain text, copy that for yourself, or if we wanna to go to a specific author, you can see all of this author's snippets. It's free to create an account, definitely do so. Next, we discussed this one in the last lesson. This is a way to copy and paste common symbols into your web page. So for example, if you want the Apple logo, rather than using an image, you can use these simple symbols. Simply click on it and paste it into your web page. Now, we haven't yet gotten to grids and why they're helpful, but if you come from a print design world, you're probably familiar that it's important to design with the grid. It keeps everything consistent. Your lines are clean. It makes for a much more appealing layout. And the same thing is true for web pages. So Zurb.com built a CSS grid builder where you can specify how many grids. Let's say we need 16 grids and each one of them needs to be 100 pixels in width. You can see how that's going to look on common screen widths. In this case, it's far too big. We'll reduce that to 50 pixels, and then we can slowly adjust to see how much of the screen we want to fill. A lot of people prefer to compensate for 1024 at the lowest, so then you can modify accordingly, like so. Then. If you get the code, you can download it, or you can copy and paste these classes here, and you're all set to get started. Now, don't worry if this is confusing. You're not quite ready for this yet, but bookmark it nonetheless, because you will be ready for it eventually. Next, CSS3 brings us access to lots of cool new properties like rounded corners and shadows and gradients. This website, borderradius.com, will allow you to quickly generate all of the necessary styling. Now, you haven't learned this just yet, but because CSS3 is so new, 
all of the browsers have their own prefixes while they experiment with these new properties. The advantage to this is that you get to experiment with these properties earlier than you would have. The downside is you need to make sure you enter the prefix for each browser. So here we have WebKit's version, here we have Mozilla's version, and then we have the official version. Now, lots of browsers support the official version now, but it's still a good idea to include these for older browsers. But if we want to specify, we want the bottom right to be 30 pixels, the top right to be zero, all of that's possible, and sometimes it's easy to forget the different syntaxes. With borderradius.com, just specify everything you need. So we'll do 30, zero here, zero here, and we'll get that kind of nice layout and then copy and paste that into your style sheet. Really helpful. Next, we come to a, a web developer's playground. He calls it the CSS3 playground. And I, I like this a lot because it allows you to experiment with lots of the new properties and the syntax that CSS3 offers. So for example, if we want to add a shadow to this box, if you don't know the syntax, you can add it right here. And we'll say we're gonna push that over and we'll specify a blur and maybe adjust the offset ever so slightly, like that. Next, we'll set a color to a grayish, and now, very easily, without knowing any code, you can generate the necessary CSS properties. In this case, it generated this right here. Notice again that we're using the browser prefixes. We can also do some fun stuff, like gradients. So if I want a green to blue gradient, you can do it like that, or a purple to red, and you can see if we scroll down, it generates the syntax that you need. We can even do fun transformations like rotate this image and scale it up and even skew it. It's definitely fun to play around with, but of course, don't ever put that into your web page. And then lastly, we come to css3please.com. This was developed by Paul Irish. And going in line with borderradius.com, it allows you to save time. So if I have a box shadow and I know I need the shadow to be 666, I can do that quickly. I can adjust the blur. And notice that it updates here immediately. If we wanna turn it into a grayish color, we can do that as well. And then simply copy this to the clipboard, return to my page, and that's ready to be pasted in. The same thing for box gradient. This is another one when you want to apply a gradient, let's say from E3E3 to 666, you have to write a lot of styling for all the browsers. Here we have WebKit, WebKit's new version, Mozilla, Microsoft, Opera, the recommended version by the W3, and then for older Internet Explorers. So that's a lot of writing, a lot to forget. Copy that to the clipboard, and we'll create a simple class now to test it out. Div, we'll give it a class of box so we can use that. Hello there. And I'm also going to apply a width and a height just for the example, like so. Now if we preview it, it has that gradient and I didn't have to write any code. So yes, definitely make sure you bookmark all 10 of these web pages. Even if you're not ready for them all right now, you will be soon. So definitely bookmark these.